Hey, I want to ask uh, the parents in a room a, a question. Why is it on Sunday morning that it gets extremely difficult to get your kids not to screw it up your house in your car on the way to church? Like, I, maybe it's just me, but it seems like there's a demonic force that just knocks stuff off our table and spills stuff on our floors and spills it in our car, and then we find donuts wedged in our seats. And anyone ever been there? Like, you find, like, the things you can find in between your seats. And it, it's a miracle that some parents get here week in and week out. It's a miracle that some of y'all got here today that don't have kids, that, you, you know, you got yourself presentable enough to come to church and and you showed up, and I just, I just, I, I want to confess to you that I probably love my hardwood floors more than I love my children right now, and I get mad when they spill stuff on them because they're new, and um, I'm just working through it. So I'm just excited to be here, and excited that my, my the grace of God is sufficient for my kids and and for my attitude towards my kids when they spill coffee. I'm just sharing my morning with you. I, I don't know. It just it happened in my house, and it perturbed me more than it should have perturbed me. And sometimes you just need to say the word perturbed because you feel better. Go ahead, try it. One, two, three. Don't, don't you feel better? Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we're studying uh, a, the longest sermon uh, that Jesus has recorded in Scripture. Uh, it was known as the Sermon on the Mount. We've, in chapter 5, we got the Beatitudes. We're hopefully going to look at those in greater detail next summer. Uh, and in chapter 6, we get some instruction in what I would call the orthopraxy of our faith. So uh, for you and I, there's a lot of religious things that we programmatically do. We don't think about what we're doing, we just do it. And there's not a lot of thought or surrender or uh, view of God that grows as a result of the doing. It's just what we know we're supposed to do. And in Jesus' time, it was no different. There were a lot of people uh, that did a lot of stuff publicly uh, that was meant to draw their eyes towards God, their hearts close to God, but in actuality, it wasn't doing anything at all when it came to affecting their relationship and their posture and their dependency and their intimacy with God. And so Jesus teaches his disciples how to neighbor at the beginning of chapter 6. How do you love your neighbor, serve your neighbor in a way that makes a difference and honors God and not just yourself and catches your neighbor's other neighbor's eyes? Uh, then he moves on to how not to pray. He talks about not praying like a hypocrite who likes to be in the right place at the right time to be seen by the right people so that when they pray, people think, oh, there goes a Christian. There goes a religious person. And instead, he says, go into a room where no one can see you and shut the door. I sing a gospel song about it last week. I won't do it this week. If you missed it, you're bad. Uh, on top of that, he says, don't pray like a babbling Gentile, meaning don't get yourself into this mode of thinking that the order in which and frequency with which you pray will render God indebted to move on your behalf. And for some of us, this has kept us from an intimate prayer life. We're worried about saying the wrong thing or praying the wrong way. We're worried about being seen by the right people. But at the end of the day, prayer is about being seen by God, not by people. And so whether you pray publicly or privately, it's about being in the presence of God and reminding yourself that by the blood of Jesus, we are the people of God and we've been brought into this divine privilege of being in the throne room with the Father in any need or concern that we get to lay before Him at, the, at His invitation because of the blood of the Son and the Spirit that leads us into prayer. Are you tracking with me? All right, y'all going to be cold or y'all going to be warm? Y'all going to get to lunch quick or y'all want to go long again? All right. So we're going we're gonna to continue in this study on how to pray. It's called the Lord's Prayer. It's been called that for a long time now, uh, but most good preachers will tell you that it's more of a disciple's prayer than the Lord's Prayer. Jesus prays what's more of his prayer in John chapter 17 when he prays that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Uh, and this is really a question that Jesus answers in Luke's gospel. The disciples come to him and they say, teach us to pray. How do we pray? And so if you've ever been in a position in your life where you know you ought to pray, but you're struggling to pray, and you don't know how to pray, you're in good company. None of the disciples apparently knew how to pray, or they were struggling to know how to pray. And so they asked Jesus to teach them how they should pray. Now, there's a lot of hang-ups that come with prayer, and I'll throw these to you really quick, because most of us never experience the intimacy that we're meant to experience in prayer, which is why most of us don't spend much time actually praying because it's meant to draw us close to God, but we just feel like we're talking to empty space in a room, and people are starting to stare at us like we're crazy. And so you, instead of praying, 
And being intimate in the presence of God, we draw away. And I think the reason a lot of us do that is because we've only ever prayed programmatically. For some of you, you have program prayers that you know you're supposed to pray at program times in the day in which you're supposed to pray them. And there's nothing wrong with these programmatic things. It's that they've lost their meaning when you utter them. You just do it, but without a conscience that turns to God, without an eye that looks for the intervention of God or the Word of God to intervene in your life. For many of you, you grew up every single night before you went to bed. You were programmed to pray. Now I... There's nothing wrong with this. It's acknowledging that another day has come. You pray the Lord your... If I die before I... I pray. Or or my toys to break. It just depends on what, how you're programmed, right? And you, you would pray that prayer every single night. Nothing wrong with you being taught how to pray through written prayers. I love, there's a book of common prayer that was written by Puritan pastors. And I love flipping and thumbing through the book of common prayer that was written by these Puritan pastors. Some of those beautiful and eloquent words. But it's meaningless unless I own those words, think on them, and allow them to turn my attention upward to speak them to the Father. Some of you at dinner have been programmed to pray right? And you have a specific prayer. What's the, what's the prayer everyone was programmed to pray at dinner, a lot of us? God is good by His our daily bread. Amen. Great prayer. Is anything untrue about what was just programmed? Is God good? Is God great? Has He provided everything that's on your table? Is He worthy of honor for giving you that? Absolutely. But if all you do is utter program prayers, there will always be a lack of intimacy because you're not allowing your heart to be seen and known before the Father who has invited you to bring it. So many of us don't experience the intimacy of prayer because we only pray programmatically. Some of us only pray out of guilt. Some of us feel guilty that we got to pray about the same stuff again, so we do it, but we feel guilty about it because we don't know that God actually likes and loves us. So there's not a confidence that comes with the prayer. There's actually a, a caution that's overly cautious, a, a fear of, I can't believe I'm still struggling here, and I don't even want to talk to you about it, God, because I talked to you about it yesterday, and I talked to you about it last week, and I talked to you about it last year, and I talked to you about it last decade. I've been talking to you about this when I had hair, and now that I don't have hair, i still got to talk to you about it, and there's a guilt that makes me not want to bring it before you. Uh, for some of us, it's, it's a guilt of we feel like we're bothering God. And so we don't experience intimacy because we feel like we got to get in and get out. we got to like interrupt really quick, but there's a lot of big world problems that God's dealing with. I mean, there's still a war going on in Ukraine, even though the news stopped reporting on it. And so there's big problems in the world, and it, with those big problems, I, I just need to get in and get out because my problems aren't so big in comparison to them. But I want to remind you that if it's bringing anxiety and worry in your life, you're not too... Worry about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, make your request known to God. That's the book of Philippians. And so if it's a worry to you, it should be a prayer before God. That emotion of worry is actually an invitation for you to pray instead of plan, instead of plot out how you're going to survive it. And so, so we're invited to pray not with guilt and not in a programmed manner, and it's supposed to lead to intimacy. Many of us don't experience it, though, the intimacy that's given to us in prayer, because we often, many of us, only pray during an emergency. Prayer is the spare tire in your car. When's the last time you thought about the spare tire in your car? The answer is the last time another tire blew. And many of us have this attitude that we've got this. We don't live in a daily acknowledgement of dependence on God. We live in an acknowledgement that the tires are blown up and we've got it today. But if the tires should go out, we will slap that sucker on there and pray to God it's got air still in it. And many of you have friends that once they put that tire on there, they will drive that thing out until the tread is gone. I had a friend that blew a tire out. It was a 50-mile tire. It's meant to get you to a gas station so that you can get some help. And he decided he was going to, in faith, push it. Six weeks later, he was still driving on that tire. And I thought to myself, self, that dude's going to end up on the side of the road, and you're going to end up having to go and help him get that tire off of his car. Prayer is not meant to be the emergency resource center you turn to. Of course, you go to God in an emergency, but thanksgiving is prayer. Praise is prayer. So you're, you don't just go when you've got a request or a petition. You go when you've got a praise. 
Uh, you go whenever he's given you another day. You, you, you go whenever anything comes up in life that you could convince yourself in your self-sufficiency that you don't need God to remind yourself that you are not independent from God, but you live as a dependent person on God. And that's the idea of prayer, that you would pray to him not just in an emergency, not just when you feel guilty, not just programmatically, but freely, ongoing in conversation as the people of God. Now, when you pray, you can be overly cautious or overly careless. And we should be mindful of this tension. If you're overly cautious in your prayer, you never lay your heart or concern before God because you're afraid to present what's really going on with you to God. And so for many of us, out of a caution of the grandeur of God, we don't understand that it's a blood-bought privilege that allows us to be in the presence of the Father so we don't actually lay what's on our heart before God. Or we try to doctor it up with enough language to make it spiritually sound good in our mind, in the ear of God, as if he's going to respond to the eloquence with which we lay it before him. So we can be overly cautious to where we never lay our hearts before him, or we can be overly careless to where we begin to think that we're coming to inform God of a perspective or of an event that he is not already aware of. We are to be neither overly cautious or overly careless. We're not to come into the presence of God as if we are about to lay it on him so that he now knows what's really happening and how he should be interacting on behalf of us. No, 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 we understand that he is God, that he is in control, that he is reigning, that he is ruling, that he is present, that he is active, that he's all-knowing, that he's all-present all the time, that he is constant, though we are constantly changing. And so we come in knowing that he is informed about the happenings of life, but we also come in knowing that we need to unwind and lay down the passions, concerns, and things that are going on within our heart. So we get to the Lord's Prayer. After he teaches us not to pray, he says this in verse 9. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food that we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Now if you have an ESV, an NASV, or a KJV, it likely has something else in the text. If you have an NLT or an NIV, it stops right there. If you have the ESV, the KJV, or the NASV, it goes on to say, for yours is the kingdom and the glory and the honor forever and ever. But if you don't have the NLT or the NIV, it doesn't say that. We'll talk about why at the very end. There's something to remember and make sure I come back to. So Jesus says, don't pray like a hypocrite. Don't pray like a babbling Gentile. Instead, pray like this. And what we get is this prayer that encompasses the entire disciples' experience every single day. It's a daily prayer that encompasses everything that we go through and will need to be reminded of every single day. You can really break it down into two parts. The first part in verses 9 and 10 is what I would call a prayer of perspective. So before we start with the petitions in the prayer of faith, we start with a prayer that reminds us of a perspective. The perspective of who we're praying to and where they're seated. So we start with the perspective of no matter what's going on on earth, no matter what's going on in our heart, no matter what we see with our eyes, we lift them upward and start with our Father who is in holy is his name. We have a Father. He's not an absent Father. He's a present Father. We spoke at great length about uh, his ongoing work as our Father. He's in heaven. That's not to note that he's far from us, but it's to note that he sees differently than us, and his perspective is greater than our perspective. And so we look to a Father who loves us, who is not absentee, but is present, who is holy, not like us. That means he may have solutions and ways in which he desires to work in things that we can't see because he ain't like us. We change, he doesn't change. We doubt, he's never doubted himself. We fear, God don't fear. My dad used to have a big old bumper sticker on the back of his truck because we were from Moonville and it said, ain't scared. <laughs> this is a true statement about God. He's not afraid. He's never been in heaven looking at the happenings on earth, wringing his hands out, wondering how he's going to get glory and how he's going to bring the story to a good ending. So we start by remembering the perspective that though we may be frazzled, Though we, though we may be disturbed, though we, we, we may be guilt-ridden, though we may be doubtful, 
though me may be filled with fear, there is a Father who is steady, present, and in control. From that perspective, we then move back to what's happening. Your kingdom come, your will be. It's a, a twofold yield. Since I have a Father that's present, that is holy, that sees differently than I see, I now can yield and remind myself that though my kingdom that I'm building may be broken, that my kingdom that may be built on plastics, batteries, and explosives, that's what all the kingdoms of man are made of, we have a God who has established a kingdom through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that is ever increasing and never decreasing. His government and his reign and his rule is growing. His return is imminent. And when he does return, he will be known as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we can trust that as his people, though we may be living in the tension of broken plastic kingdoms on earth, we now have become citizens of a kingdom that is not plastic, that is not broken, and does not lack in power. So we start with his kingdom before we bring our kingdom to him. He's at work in our kingdom, but it's his kingdom work that he's doing within our kingdom. That's why Matthew chapter 6 says, before we come before him with petitions and needs and a prayer of faith, that's the second part of the prayer, we first start with this prayer of perspective. And we have this divine yield moment where we recognize that as people of God, we no longer are primary citizens of the kingdom of this world. Your citizenship has changed. You may be in a country called America, but your primary citizenship is in a kingdom with the king. And you belong to him before you belong to your country. And you bow to him before you have an allegiance to that country. That's why I continue to say that those that put flags up in front of the church have it wrong. There's God's flag, then there's any other country that comes underneath that flag. And if you're not comfortable with that, you have fallen into something that is not good. It's a love of country before a love of God that makes you think that the American flag belongs above the Christian flag. No, it does not. The Christian flag, the American flag is first. We are kingdom citizens First, you may be sent to the nations. You may keep a dual citizenship there. But what you need to keep in mind is that your primary dual citizenship, now that Jesus has intersected your life, starts with his kingdom and then leads you as a missionary and an ambassador and a pilgrim that's passing through into the kingdoms of this world. Many of you don't like to hear that because you're a settler. You want to settle in this kingdom. And your goal is to get God secondarily to make your kingdom primarily comfortable. And so you can't come to God and pray with conviction because you're still trying to get him to make your kingdom come. And it's not your kingdom that he's behind or empowering or bringing into this earth. It's his kingdom. So you don't experience a lot of power in prayer because all you do is pray prayers of a broken kingdom, asking God to fix and duct tape something that he's done away with that will fade away. This is the beautiful message. When you understand that you are a kingdom citizen, that you belong to God, then you're able to honor those that he's put in authority in the broken kingdoms of earth without having to see them as a threat. No king has ever snuffed out a move of God. No government has ever stopped the work of the Great Commission going forward. Christians stop that on their own in America. But overseas, they try to squash it and kill it with persecution, and guess what happens? It grows. It goes farther. I know this makes us uncomfortable in our comfor comfortable uh, citizenship within the United States, but I just simply want to remind you that the prayer perspective starts with a divine yield that says, no, no, your kingdom over my kingdom. That's what Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 calls us to. Let me remind you of it. Pray like, uh, not pray like this, Matthew 6, 33, a little bit earlier, or a little bit later, since Matthew 6, 33, and the, yep, okay, seek the kingdom of Seek it. Many of you wake up and you seek a mirror, you seek a bathroom, you seek breakfast, you seek coffee. That's primary. You seek not waking your kids up. You seek a moment of peace where you can calm yourself down. And the Bible says before any of it, seek the kingdom of God above all else. The kingdom is to be preeminent in your view of whatever you view. 
Seek the kingdom of God above else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. The second part of the Lord's Prayer deals with your needs. But the first part of the Lord's Prayer deals with what you need before you get those needs met. And that is, you need to be in a kingdom that's not going away. You need to be in a kingdom that has a king that's reigning and ruling and returning. You need to be in a kingdom with a king that's stable. Every, every human being flip-flops. God don't. Are you tracking with me? So we seek first the kingdom of God. We yield to his kingdom. The kingdoms of the earth are built on plastics and explosives, but God's kingdom is built on his promise and his power and his character. When God's kingdom takes priority in your mind, your heart, and life, the things needed to live as a kingdom citizen are provided for. The question that keeps many of us away from God is that we cannot get to your kingdom because my kingdom is still in the way. But the idea of this prayer, the idea of this prayer, is that though we do not fully see the kingdom of God in the world around us, that as kingdom citizens, that would not be the experience within us. Yes, his kingdom is coming one day, but for us, the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us today. The reign of God that's promised over all creation reigns over us today. So it's not a one day, it's a two day, God, your kingdom come over my life. What's the second part of the divine yield? We yield to his kingdom and we yield to his, his will. Your will be that's a tough one. How many of you have ever thought, and I know you would never say this out loud and you won't raise your hand, but let's be honest. How many of you have ever thought, God's not doing this right? If I were God, I would not choose that for what we would do. How many of you have ever had that moment? God, if it's possible that your will not be what I'm experiencing it, let's change it. Anybody been there? Okay. Good company. In the book of Matthew, later on, Jesus would pray in Matthew chapter 26 as he was on his way to the cross in verse 39. He went on a little farther, bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. That's laying your heart before the Father. Yet, I want your will. Not mine. Yes, I have a will. Here it is, God, I would love, one of my favorite exercises with people, some people come to my office and they're stressed out and they're worried, and I'm like, okay, I want you to take a blank piece of paper, and I'm like, all right, because everyone loves an assignment whenever you're trying to figure it out, tell me what I got to do. I'm like, all right, so write on everything you want. I'm like, okay. Some people are really like, they, they know in detail, they learn, get specific on that road, no debt with that car. Kids that look that way and stop saying that thing. Like, okay. Now, you're like, okay, what do I do? I'm like, take the paper, wad it up, throw it in the trash can. And you can watch their soul just die a little bit. And it's not that God doesn't care what you want. It's that sometimes you can't get to what God wants because what you want is so loud. So sometimes writing it down and throwing it away then helps you to go, okay, God. Here's what I want. I know you saw every word of it. I know you know what I want, what I would desire. But I want at the end of the day, above all those wants on that page, what you want. I want above every will that I'm, just, I'm voicing of how I would want you to move. I want your will. So God, your will above my want, your way above my way. I have a preferred way for God to provide an answer. And moving my life, but before I lay my needs before you, God, I want to remind myself and yield to the fact that your will is better than my will. So we, we have this divine yield in this prayer perspective that says, God, I am a kingdom citizen. Some of you are getting too wrapped up in civilian duties when you're not a civilian anymore. So you can't pray like a kingdom citizen because you're praying like a citizen of the earth. And it's getting in the way of you seeing God's way and God's will and God's presence in prayer. It's God, I, I'm a kingdom citizen, not a citizen of this earth. And God, I, I have a will, but it's not your will, so help me to see your will before it gets in your way. So we yield, we yield, and in that perspective, we then pray this prayer of faith which brings the petitions, the needs in our life before God. Look at what verse 11 says. Uh, verse 11, give us today 
the food we need. Notice that, that mentioning. It's not give us this decade in the storehouse so that we don't have to go to the grocery store, so that if a famine comes, we don't have to worry, so that we're prepared for whatever's going to happen. It's today. Enough to honor you today. Enough to be sustained today. Why? Because God lacks? Because God is selfish? No, because God knows that when you stray in independence from him, it goes wrong. This prayer is meant to lead you to remember every day, every moment, you need him. Guess what you didn't just tell yourself to do? You didn't just say heartbeat. But God knows every beat of your heart. Everybody do a sec, this for Take a deep breath. You didn't make that. You didn't make any of it. You didn't make the chemical compound that made oxygen or the planet that is finely tuned specifically to be on an axis where that chemical is present. Nowhere else in our solar system can you find it. You go a little bit towards the sun, we're going to burn up. You go just a, a, a few feet away, we freeze. You didn't, you didn't tell it right there on the axis. You didn't weigh the mountains. You don't know how many grains of dirt are on the beach. He does. You didn't knit yourself together in your mother's womb. You don't know the number of hairs on your head. I want you to consider this. Most of us spend our Christian life... Most of us spend our life, before we meet Jesus, running from the fact that we need God. We come to this breaking moment where we realize we are dependent on God, and then we spend the rest of our Christian life trying to act like we're independent from God. We like to call it stewardship, but there's a point where stewardship's just selfish. Where it moves from being a good steward to, to moving to being just greedy. So you're like, he's going to talk about giving in church. No, keep your greedy dollar in your daggum pocket and stay here and let the spirit work on you because this is apparently an idol for some of you. Because every time money comes up, the, the assumption is, oh, we're talking about giving to the church. No, you don't give to your neighbor. Well, I, I just believe in a New Testament view of giving, which is at will, and you've never conceded to his will, which would potentially call you to sacrifice for your neighbor around you. So I'm not Old Testament, I'm New Testament. In the New Testament, they gave until the disciples were like, stop giving, we got too much. We've met the need. So don't, 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 don't like dance around your idol, like, it's not an idol, don't look here, <laughs> the pastor's here, it's not a problem, it's not a problem, Let's go to the kitchen, let's go to the kitchen. We'll talk about gluttony. I'd rather talk about gluttony. Let's not talk about money. Is the silence the amen? Yeah. Okay, okay. Just checking. Notice what it's saying. God, give me today what I need. I love this statement. An uh, uh, old church preacher said, uh, wrote it. I can't remember his name right now off the top of my head. But he said, Lord, do not give me so much that I think I don't need you or too little to where I can't worship you. Don't, don't allow me to be blessed to a point to where the blessing becomes what I worship, where I turn my attention and my focus to it. You see, most of us don't struggle with daily sustenance here in America. You've got options for lunch. Most of you struggle. The real prayer some of us should be praying is, God, help me not eat all of it. But in... in Jesus' time with the disciples, I mean, getting food was most of your day. You had to make significant plans. You harvest, you're one harvest away from famine and starvation. And so the people of Israel are broken free in the book of Exodus, and they're led out into a desert where food's going to be a problem. And so God decides in Exodus chapter 16, he's going to do something amazing. You know what he does? He rains down manna. And guess what he tells them to do? See, the American way of viewing this miracle when God rained down manna is we should hoard it because we don't want to waste the miracle because we don't, we don't want to depend on him. We don't want to be dependent on God to provide. I mean, good stewardship is we're going to freeze bag and, you know, like can this stuff. You know what happened when they canned it? Worms. You know what happens to a lot of people's legacies that canned it? 
worms. Their family fights and divides over what they leave behind. And instead of it being something that honors God and they give honor and glory to God for it, they just fight and split the family up over it. This is a big tension. It's a big stewardship you've been called to. None they're called to get just enough for today. And on the Sabbath, you take just enough for that day that you were on and the day to come, the Sabbath day, whenever you would rest. So the idea is that we are to be dependent on God. Why? Because God provides for our needs. Skip Heitzig, a pastor in New Mexico, said, God promised to provide for your needs, but not your greeds. I'll move on. The second petition comes. God provide for my needs. That's number one. Number two, God forgive us our sins. Why? Because his forgiveness runs out. Because there's a punch card, you get 100 sins, and then you've got to get a new one. No, no, that's not the way it works. Once you turn to Christ in faith, he forgives you for everything that you've done. He forgives you for everything that you were doing leading up to that moment. And the grandeur of our salvation is he forgives you for everything that you will do. You've never shot God. He's never been like, oh, I just can't believe you humans strayed and went and did that. I mean, he, he's seen generations of stupidity. So, I mean, you may think you're stupid, but I mean, like, in, in weight of all of history, you know, you're just about the normal. It's about normal. And, and, and in that, what we, what we see is this constant reminder that needs to remind us that we are not saved by works, but by faith. So God, forgive me my sins. Why? Because I am often prone to forget that God, by grace, has saved me. I didn't earn the gift, and I can get into a works-based faith that thinks that I have to earn my standing before God to get back in his good graces. No, forgive me my sins. Why? Because what he's provided for us is forgiveness of our sins now and in the future. Now, notice what it's tied to, though. It's not tied to, I won't forgive you, but it's tied to, some of you can be a pond instead of a river. God's mercies are new every morning. His grace, when we come to him, is available to us. But it's supposed to soften us so that when we are sinned against, we let go of their sin too. There's a story, a parable, I'm sure you'll love it, and it'll be the same silence that you know, I've been dealing with for the last 10 minutes of the sermon. And... Uh, in it, there is this slave who has a significant debt that he owes to his owner, and his owner takes that significant get debt and he forgives him. So then, th that slave, being forgiven of his debt that was great and, and massive, sees a much smaller debt that someone owes him. Rather than modeling what the owner had done for him, he then goes to his fellow slave and servant, and threatens to kill him if he doesn't pay his debt back. For many in this room, we profess a forgiveness that others never will experience apart from our forgiveness to them in the moments where they've done the unforgivable to us. And the place that you drum up the ability to, do, to extend that forgiveness is not within and of yourself, and it's not because you ought to or you should, but when you sit before the presence of God recognizing that you have been freely forgiven... The power and the humility of that should soften your heart to those who need forgiveness from you. Now, forgiveness is not reconciliation. It's not saying that the wrong didn't hurt. It's not saying that you should uh, immediately restore relationship and hang out again and get together on Friday nights and cook hot dogs. That, that is not what forgiveness is necessarily about. It leads to that being a possibility, but it is not immediately what follows. Instead, forgiveness... It's taking the wrongs you've closed your hand around and choosing to entrust them to the same place where you found your forgiveness. Christ's cross or Christ's judgment. So when I forgive, I come to Christ's cross and I recognize that his blood is sufficient for me to let go of the sin. I don't have to, I, this is the power of the cross. I am forgiven for what I've done, but I'm also delivered from what's been done to me and whom I've been. So I can come to the cross and I can say, Jesus, like I want vengeance, I want blood. And Jesus says at the cross, here's the blood. Here's the blood. And what you get in that moment is the opportunity to say, I can trust that your blood is enough for me to let go. 
or trust that if they never turn to you, there is no injustice that is done that will not be either accounted to your blood and cross or to your judgment in return. And no court system on this earth will ever do what God will do in the end of time when he brings his just judgment to earth. So I don't have to hold what was done to me as a reason to be bitter to everyone around me, as a reason to be distrusting in future relationships that will come to me. No, I can let go of what's been done to me and trust that the blood of Jesus and the judgment of Jesus are sufficient for me to walk forward in the call that God has on my life. God forgives our sins. And it impacts us to be an extension of that forgiveness to others. For many of us, we don't believe God actually forgives us, so we don't forgive others. We don't feel like we've earned God's forgiveness, so we make others earn their forgiveness from us. This is really a gospel issue. It's an issue of you understanding the good news of your forgiveness and the ability of that same forgiveness to reach through you into the lives of others. The second petition, God, forgive us our sins. The final one, deliver us from temptation. Don't allow us to get to a place or to a moment where we can't honor you, where we in sin are overcome by temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says it this way, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. What's the promise? When you are tempted. So for some of you, you're going to go home today and you have this habit. It's not good. It's not God honoring. You've kept it secret and silent. And you're going to find yourself in the setting for that to happen. The scripture teaches there are certain settings that you don't endure. You run. So what's his provision? His provision is he's given you his word. And you know this is the setting for failure to happen. So instead of sitting in the setting and going, I'll make it, you in wisdom with his word go, no, I'm running and I'm going to make it. I'm fleeing. He will give you a way out. So for some of you, it's the familiarity of the grace that he's given you that's forgiven you for what you've done. But that grace was not so that you could go and sit in the place that you used to be in the failure. It's so that you know, I've been forgiven, I'm not condemned, I'm not separated, I'm not cut off in fellowship with God, but I'm not staying here. I got a friend, he planted a church in one of the worst neighborhoods of Baltimore, Maryland, in a neighborhood called Colgate. They got methadone clinics on every block. His church will never be more than about 75 people. You know why? Because it's so meth inundated that when someone comes to Jesus, they start to get clean. And within a few weeks and months of discipleship, guess what they do? They get out of the neighborhood. He knows it. We're going to lead them to Christ. We're going to disciple them for a few weeks. They're going to move on. And maybe someday, one day down the road, they'll come back clean. But they're not going to stay in this environment. They're going to move out of it and not endure or stay in it. Let me ask you this. How many of you are praying, God, do not lead me into temptation, yet you're going to go home and walk right into an environment that you know is too much? May this prayer be a reminder and an admonishment to you that sometimes running is what the Christian does. We flee from temptation. Now, why do some of you have the words, for yours is the kingdom and the glory and the honor? forever and ever written in another stone. Here's the deal. The earliest manuscripts do not have that ending in it. So the NLT and the NIV, they get together with a lot of men uh, and women and they translate English and they translate Hebrew and they look at word for word or word to culture in those translations from the Hebrew, from the Greek, and they make decisions. And so this group in the NLT and the NIV, they decided, well, that's not the earliest one, so we're going to exclude that. Now, the earliest manuscripts we have, some date within 15 to 20 years of the events. Some date within 30 to 40 years. Some, some date later within that. All scattered all over the earth, come into agreement with each other, and we don't see major variation, which is why we can trust our Bible and our Word. I gave myself a ton of time to talk about that. But here's my point. Is it wrong to end the Lord's Prayer with, yours is the kingdom? Nope. And the power and the glory? Nope. Is anything we're saying untrue about that? Nope. 
it's a common Jewish practice to begin and end with a reminder. We begin with what we're saying, then we fill in what we need, and then we end with the reminder. We started with his kingdom, so we're going to end with his, yeah. It was started about being about his will and his glory, so we're going to end with it being about his will and his glory. Here, here's my point. For some of you, what you need most is not more talking from the preacher. Everybody said amen. Amen. You just need to pray. You just need to pray. Because the Son, through the Spirit, has made a way for you to be heard. You don't need to be careless and you don't need to be overly cautious, but you need to pray. Some of you prayed once back in like 1993 about something, and it's time to pray again about it. And you're going to pray about a challenge in your life today, and tomorrow you're going to need to pray about it again. You're going to need to yield. You're going to need to be reminded. You're going to need to trust in the process of God answering and showing you the answer to the prayer. You're going to need to keep praying. But for, for some of you, you just quit. You quit praying. You quit praying. At this church, we pray over people. We have a prayer team that at the end of each service comes to pray for you. We don't stand here out of obligation. We stand here in expectation that some of you right now need a brother or sister to put their arm around you and pray about something that you are struggling in and don't even know how to articulate. We can help. For some of you need to bow on your knees before God and pray that God would endure you until a breakthrough happens. Do that. That's normal. What's abnormal is for you to be needing of God and to act like you don't really need Him. To be desperate for God, but you to act like, oh, let's get through it. We'll be all right. No, you need Him. So, Pray, pray, pray. Pray at the altar, pray at your seat, pray bending, pray standing, pray. Just pray, just pray. You move us to the Lord and leads. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's stand, let's sing, let's respond.